well doing for you will reap a harvest of blessings if you don't give up and uh and i'm reaping those blessings and i, I will say there's times where character building seems the hardest what's up everybody my name is bailey i'm trent welcome to crucifying addiction today we have a special guest for you go ahead and introduce yourself my name is christopher what's up chris how's it going man it's going all right it's going on so chris tell us a little bit about yourself man like where are you from well i'm originally from san angelo born here at shannon medical center lived here for about nine years and we moved to winters texas uh stayed to winters pretty much the majority of my life where i grew up at yeah, and then you know from there it's just jumping around from one thing to another because of addiction. Sweet. Where do you work? Right now I work at Pepsi. I'm actually in the warehouse. Believe it or not, it's pretty awesome. This is my second day back, and you know I had a paternity leave. I just had a, a, a newborn son, so I had four Congrats. weeks paid. And you know those are just the blessings that God gives you when you're making the right decisions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course, man. I mean, yeah, I want, I want kids. Fixing to turn 19 actually here. You know, couple weeks so tell me what, what that's like wait wait in a couple of weeks yeah my uh my birthday's may 10th i need to mark that on my calendar <laughs> <laughs> pretty awesome having kids does help you start to live for uh more than just yourself you know decisions mm-hmm. that you start to make that uh can be selfish or, or running and gunning thinking you can just go to the grocery store or thinking you just go to the mall And uh, you just can't do that by yourself. You got another little one to kind of carry with you. So take your time on on, on the kids. Enjoy (laughs) enjoy your life for now. I sure am in no rush. I'm 27. (laughs) Do you want kids though? Yeah, we're planning on it the next year or so after we get into a house. Ooh. I will say I was 31 when I had my first kid. So that makes me feel good. Yeah. I wouldn't mind being that old when I have my first kid. I think my mom was 20, 26 when she had my brother and then 30 when she had me. So take your time, man. All right, Chris. So now that you're finally here, let's make the most of it. Yeah. Yeah. You're in the recovery community. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, what it was like, what happened and what happened and what it's like now, but let's just start with the, what was it like? And go ahead as early as you want to go from the beginning, man. Mm-hmm. I guess it's from the beginning. I always like to say that uh, the enemy was after me. I was born a uh, cesarean baby. I uh, had the bill cord wrapped around my neck, and I was pretty much a blue baby, you know, off, off, off the top. And uh, so as I moved further in life and I saw God's hand on me, I realized that he was after me. But growing up uh, through poverty, domestic violence, uh, multiple uh, cops and paddy wagons at the house after my dad, for, you know, beating my mom and uh, woman shelters all the way up to the age of six was already pretty much uh, a pretty big imprint on uh, who I was to become later on in life. By the time I was six years old, my dad go to, went to prison for six years. And at that time, he had family in Winters. And that's when he kind of persuaded my mom to move to Winters to be around uh, his family where he, she can get a little bit of help. Uh, I do have two other brothers and sisters. And so there's five of us and a single mom and you know, it, it didn't make it any easy through uh, through all the, the things she's been through and really checking out mentally, you know, going through her own storms. So that kind of just left me to kind of do my own thing. So through the hurt and the anger and the frustration of uh, times, you know, prior to with my dad and him not being there and just my mom kind of checking out mentally, I just I just ran, you know, to the street, so to speak. I was in sixth grade and I got suspended for being uh, associated with weed. As my grandma was taking me to my mom's house, I was very scared, right? I was like, man, my mom's about to get on to me. I'm about to be in trouble. Even though I knew she mentally checked out at times, she still would kind of showcase some sense of accountability and discipline Mm -hmm. and maybe not herself, but she would kind of pass it over to my older brother. So I didn't want her to tell my older brother. Well, when I show up at the apartment, she literally was, for a loss of words, she wasn't herself. She was in the middle of the floor, kind of didn't know where she was at. I had to pick her up. We walked about three apartments down, and she thought it was her house, and I had to tell her it wasn't, and I walked her back to the apartment, but she was on antidepressants and alcohol mixed. And, you know, for me to walk uh, from sixth grade, thinking I'm about to get in trouble, to actually taking care 
a grown adult, that really, you know, that really said a lot about what I was coming from. Mm. But yeah, man. So, so by 13 years old, man, uh, alcohol was, was it. I, I was just shooting alcohol to the back of my throat because I hated the taste, but I knew it, it would, it would get me drunk. It would, it would get me intoxicated. And more importantly, it would help me numb the pain that I was feeling, but also I felt accepted. I felt accepted by the people around me. At that time, you know, I was really just missing school, not really showing up to like third or fourth period. It really, it didn't matter to me. You know, I didn't have anyone on me to get to school or anything. So I was like, eh, I'm going to just do what I need to do. And there's something that they say that kids can do sometimes when they're not getting attention. They'll make bad behaviors so they can get, even if it's negative attention. 14 years old, that's when I was introduced to cocaine. This girl that I would mess with, she was about 18, and she was literally the one, you know, that was dealing it. And, I mean, I started doing that, started interva- intravenous using with needles. I had a friend that was a year younger than me. He had beat acumia cancer. So he was used to being poked and pricked. So he was the one that would actually, you know, shoot us up. Mm. So it was, it was just an array of, of, of a mess, man. And, and, you know, at 15 years old, I got put on probation for having weed and, and, you know, I was on juvenile probation. I didn't adhere to that. I got, uh, unsuccessfully discharged, got kicked out of school and I was, uh, at alternative school at 15 years old. Then I got introduced to, uh, crank. Crank, crank. was, yeah, crank was something. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's the stuff that is before meth. Uh, what they used to call it was Nazi dope. And, uh, Oh, okay. I was about to say, I was like, I've never heard of crank before. So yeah. Well, they would get it from the uh, anhydrous tanks out there in the uh, from farmers, and uh, so what you would do is you would run and go steal the chemical, and you would mix it with pills to cook it. The farmers started making police reports and things of their anhydrous getting stolen, so there was cameras starting to be put out there, and so as there's cameras out there, people ain't taking the risk, and that's where meth was born. Mm-hmm. So at fifteen, man, it, you know. It was pretty bad. At 16 years old, I actually had my mom sign me out of school. I said, I, I'm, I'm done with school. I'm not going anymore. And at 16, you know, uh, me and her walked up there and we talked to the principal. She signed me out of school and I had to go to the uh, to courts just to the peace because I was an adult. And you're eligible to take the GD test at 17 years old. I was 16, so I was still deemed a minor. But since my mom co-signed for me to be out of school. We went to Justice of Peace. He told me that uh, within the year, he wants me to take GD classes. And then by 17, he wants me to go for the test. What other 16-year-old do you know that doesn't have no accountability, no school after him because, you know, the court system said to go to GD classes. I mean, I was running amok. Cocaine, crank, alcohol, marijuana, it didn't matter. Uh, I was doing it all and I was shooting up, you know, by 14 years old. So it didn't matter. That's when it got, it got pretty crazy real fast. Probably about three months after getting checked out of school. It was probably one of the the biggest days of my life. It's one of the uh, timelines. As much as I was using from an early age, everything is just a flash for me. I don't really have memories of, of, of how things went, but it's these big events that I've done that helped me kind of, you know, judge these timelines, gauge them, you know? Mm-hmm. So in April of 2004, I was pretty drunk, pretty high, been at it all day. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I was pretty mad. I, I went to a next door neighbor's house and they didn't want to let me in. I thought they were partying and they didn't want me to party with them no more. <laughs> so I ended up hitting the guy in his face and was like, forget you, you know, just pretty mad. And he went back inside and I went to my aunt's and I put a, a, a kitchen knife in my back pocket. And I was like, the next person that messes with me is going to get it. So I'm walking around with the kitchen knife, probably about, you know, 12 to, to 14 inches long. So it's poking out of my back pocket, you know. <laughs> Wait, did he like, go through your pants? Or? No, I just, I had the uh, the knife part down in my back pocket. Yeah. I still picture it going through your pant pocket. Yeah. yeah. Nah, well, it's a kitchen knife. It's probably dull. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> it wasn't so like, like part of it's like sticking out. Yes. So everybody could see that other part of the blade still. And... I mean, it's probably under my shirt. 
You know what I mean? And it's already 1130 at night. I'm walking by myself. I'm trying to go to this trailer house where this uh, this guy, he's probably in his 30s. And a lot of the a lot of the girls that were a couple years older than me would go over there because they can get alcohol and, you know, smoke a little bit of stuff to sober up. So I'm like, I need to sober up. It's raining and everything. I'm knocking at his door and he's like, he ain't having it. He don't want me around. He's running me off. And I'm just like, you know, all right. So I, I, I this guy's going to take me home and I get in his truck and I'm, I'm, I'm buzzing pretty hard. And, and the next thing I know, that same guy comes out of his trailer is accusing me of stealing the guy's truck. And I, I wasn't trying to steal it. You know, it really set me off to be accused of that right and i mean granted i've done done all kinds of throwed off things but maybe i was looking for a reason because mm. if you just look back i was putting a kitchen knife in my back pocket saying the next person that messes with me so him just saying that i felt like i was looking for a reason and uh lord and behold man i, I cut the man three times you know uh, i chased him down with a knife and he fell and uh i stood over him and i was swinging the knife crazily like a wild man I was 16 years old at the time, and he was 34. And what snapped me out of it is I cut myself on inside of my left bicep, and because I was just swinging so radically, yeah. And uh, it snapped me out when I saw blood. I was like, "What the heck did I just do?" And I took off running, and I, I went to another friend's, probably across town, and I ended up changing clothes and burying the knife, thinking that you know, no evidence. I'm not going to get caught. And so I'm, I'm heading back home probably at two o'clock in the morning and the cops are just sitting there waiting for me down the street from my house. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they picked me up and, and there I was in a juvenile detention center right here in San Angelo, Texas. Well, Lord and behold, my dad gets out of County jail. He's been out a day. He takes the stand in court to say that he could take me in. And they ask him, well, where have you been? Where, where has your address been the last three months? <laughs> <laughs> and literally, he had to say the Ballinger County Jail. So, like, <laughs> 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 so you can just imagine what the judge was thinking. <laughs> he, was trouble trying. Don't fall. Dude, he was trying. He was trying. <laughs> trouble don't fall far from trouble. Right, right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, Lord and behold, of course, I ended up, I was still in juvenile. They weren't going to release me. And, uh, yeah, they gave me an option either to get trial as an adult or to take a, a TYC, uh, sentence, which was a year. So I was like, you know what, you know, getting tried as adults, two to 20 years, second degree felony doing a year in the TYC program. I'll just go for that. So I ended up doing about 18 months at 16 years old. Mm. One of the biggest things that. I found in there was God. Um, there was a, a man that would go and he would bring us, you know, the Bible and, and, and studies and church. And that's where I started finding a real relationship. So you, did, you didn't have a relationship at all with him before? I knew him and I knew he was for me and I knew he was always there with me, but I didn't put my faith in him. Mm. Okay. What was that? Like, was there just a click? Like it just happened or it, it was more like i had probably about four to five months of clarity finally mm -hmm. no crutch or running to an addiction to escape my feelings or my emotions so i had to confront self and even more importantly than that uh there was a lot of gang uh affiliation in tyc where i was at you had sutreses that were a bunch of mexicans you had Bloods and Crips, and I didn't want to be affiliated. So I found my getaway in Christ. I found my peace in, in church when I had the opportunities. And that is really what kind of gave me that umbrella of protection uh, as, and through my incarceration. Like he was revealing himself within the walls of confinement by the acts of seeing people getting jumped while they're butt naked in the shower by five or six people. And that person wasn't me. It let me know that God had his hand on me, mm. you know? And uh, so I stayed faithful to that truth. Don't just be a hero of the word, but be a doer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed obedient to going to church, 
you know, trying to trying to actually implement spiritual principles in, into my character. And uh, it, it, like I said, it showed myself true. There were times where uh, I did get jumped before um, when I went to the restroom and and like when they try to throw a towel over my face, kind of like hide my eyes, I guess, while the other guy was going to you know, swing on me. Like I was able to duck fast enough that he only hit the top of my head like four times and I got a pretty big head. So it didn't even hurt. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was just times like that. And then on our march to chow hall and stuff, I'd just be praying to him for protection because it was, it was really chaotic. I mean, just imagine having, uh, anywhere from 14 and 20 year old kids all confined in a small place with a lot of hurt, aggression, anger, and resentment that really didn't know how to walk it out. You know, things can be uh, uh, combust real quick. And especially when people are affiliated with gangs, uh, they feel like they have to show their self truth or get acceptance through their gang by doing some wild stuff. For me to be protected in, in that whole time I was there, by God, he showed himself truth. You know, and that's where my relationship started to build. I will say, and, and you know, this this is a podcast of addiction and breaking that, right? Part of the consequences of the choices you make in vanity happened to me really quickly, not just with incarceration, but uh, I got diagnosed with hepatitis C, chronic. And that was from sharing needles, mm -hmm. from intravenous using. And I just say that just to kind of be a voice for those that are thinking that an escaping or numbing of your feelings or emotions through a, a addiction and alcoholism, you can really hurt yourself, not just with lifelong mistakes that you may look back on, but even with your health. I just want to be a voice for that. I got out though in August, 2005, you know, I'm getting out. I got 18 months clean, you know, and uh, I'm expecting my family all to not be drinking no more, not be drugging my friends mm. to be sober and Dude, the first day I got home, they're throwing a party, bro. Like, just a big mm. old party. And I'm just like, man, that's when reality set in on me. Like, just because you change don't mean people are going to change. Mm. Yeah. And that goes without saying, you know, uh, you, they say you hang around the barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. And uh, there I was thinking that I could be that voice of sobriety and Christ and of God to a drunken, intoxicated people, I'm lying to myself. You know, I didn't know that at the time. I thought I, was, I had good intentions. But before you know it, I was drinking, doing coke, smoking crank again. How old were you when you uh, got out? 18. 18? And how long did you stay sober before you drank again? About a month. About a month. month and a half. Yeah, I didn't stay. I, I, didn't, I wasn't out long before I was back at it. Mm. You know, after 18 months of, of being incarcerated and I felt like I got my GD while I was in there, I literally got about 14 credits within a year, you know, my high school credits and I never did a day in high school. Like I was just getting at it when I was in there, you know? Yeah. So I guess I felt defeated, you know, is, is why I turned back to it. I felt like I was going to bring some fresh, a uh, new sense of life and they weren't there yet. To your family. To my family. And they just weren't there yet. And so I felt like I failed. And, you know, I think that's part of the lesson as you grow in sobriety. And also they call it like a sanctification process. Mm -hmm. Part of that is learning. Am I going to put an expectation on someone to do what I'm doing? Or do I need to love them where they're at, but also have discretion and discernment on when to be around and when not to? You know what I mean? And I've learned that in the long run. I wish I would have learned it in the beginning, but it's still a good lesson. So you went back out after a month of being out. Yeah. You went out after being out. Yeah. How long did that last? Well, I was on parole. So when you get out of TYC, you're on parole. I was out a month. I had two dirty UAs and I basically went on the run. I was staying out of my girlfriend's house. I was 18. She was about 26. I remember just like hiding out in her crib because they knew where my aunt lived. They knew where my mom lived. So I wasn't going to stay over there. So I was just hiding out at her house. And like literally the cops went over there one day. I don't know if my aunt told him I was there, but I was like literally hiding under a twin size bed. 
<laughs> when they like literally, <laughs> they 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 point like when they knocked. I guess the cops. They're like, "No, you're not hiding here." I guess the not my girlfriend, but the people she was staying with. And so they pointed them exactly where I was at. So there I am, crawling out of from under a twin size bed, feeling like a fool already. You know? <laughs> and uh, the twin size bed. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So parole violation. Yeah, back yeah. to county. Go to county for about a month. Go back to TYC. Sit there for four months. I get out. I'm back on parole again because I didn't finish it the first time. And so there I am just kind of moving along still. I, I got out. I just was using. Like I didn't even try to stay sober. Mm. It, I, I, you know, I just, I only had four months. You know, only, I did four months from January to April when they caught me. It was like the end of December. And so I was just like, boom, I'm just going back to what I was doing. I started selling methamphetamines pretty much as soon as I got out, maybe a couple months later. That's a full-time job. Yeah, it is. I was, yeah, I was uh, between Winters and Abilene and Winters San Angelo consistently, probably about three times a week, uh, picking up and stuff like that. And so it wasn't no good. It drained me. I became a dead man walking, basically. Mm. You, you know, you hear of... Um, the walking dead is what I was going to get at. You hear about the walking dead. And when you see someone on methamphetamines, that's what they remind me of. Mm. They're just walking dead. There's no spirit. Mm. You know, there was a book I read that's called meth and sorcery. What it's talking about is how methamphetamines is actually witchcraft. Cause it's the mixing and brewing of chemicals. Mm. Abs. I totally believe that. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. The way people change. Mm. The things that I did, the ways I thought on meth, unnatural things. It's unnatural. Among every other drug, methamphetamine stands alone as a spirit killer. What makes it different between any other drug? After three days of being up on meth, you start to see shadows and things are moving. You start to believe the most ridiculous things about the people around you. And I think the biggest thing about it is that you you forfeit your sleep. Yeah. Sleep deprivation. I think the longest I've gone was six or seven days with Eight. no sleep. What about you? Eleven. Eleven days. Yeah. I Eight. couldn't imagine, man. I cried myself to sleep thinking I was going to die that night and said goodbye to everybody in my family and laid down thinking that I was – taking my last breath and then i woke up like 12 hours later after finally getting some sleep well you know dude and i i I couldn't imagine that because i didn't even know you could not sleep for 11 days i knew you can go quite a while but not 11 the cops have woken me up three times passed out at a gas station sitting in my car while it was running so is that the drug that's keeping you awake yeah because your brain eventually shuts down so it doesn't have that like life alert sense to you need to sleep now mm-hmm. and starts making you go to sleep. It just shuts it down. Once the tolerance gets built with the methamphetamines, it, the, the life alert does happen in, in like uh, mm. increments. But so you need to take more hits a lot sooner. Mm. You know, in the beginning stages, you can uh, have a little bit and it might keep you up all day. Right. You know, if you want to stay up longer. You have to continuously do the drug. Continuously. Yeah. You could take, so you could, 20 bucks will get you three days. Right. And then after that, you need that 20 bucks like every few hours yeah. to continue to go. Oh, man. And you do it because you have signed yourself away to this thing. And, you know, going back to the, uh, how I feel like it's, it's very much a, you know, spiritual. I think all drugs, they're all spiritual mm-hmm. welfare, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Just the idea, though, with the uh, with the meth is is sleep deprivation, and you're not taking in proper nutrition because you don't have appetite. He's it's not good. Him. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm selling drugs. I'm on parole for TYC. This is the second time that uh, I've been on it. Uh, I got out April 2006. I was out about eight months, nine months, and I was at a motel, the Budgeted Inn, right here in Ballinger, Texas. I was hanging out with the guy that was selling out of the the main office. He was running the motel and he was selling out of there. And Lord and behold, 
I'm in the restroom and the next thing you know, I have a gun pointed to my head and a badge in my face. The sheriff's office, task force, and the county cops had just raided us. They pretty much put us in handcuffs, put us in the front of the, uh, the, the office at the motel, had a guy with the bulletproof vest and a shotgun guarding us while they ransacked the rest of the motel. That's when I graduated to an adult court. Mm. Uh, so I didn't even get off of parole for TYC before I graduated to adult court. I literally slept for three weeks before I even tried to bail out. That's how I, I, I literally, to be honest, out of them nine months, I might have slept 18 to 24 hours in a month. It was bad. January 18th, 07, I get out. I'm going to court. My uh, TYC pro officer says there's nothing we can do. Like, we can't revocate you because we can't put you back into TYC because now you're in adult courts. So basically, we're going to be keeping an eye on you until the adult courts figure out what they're going to do with you and basically hand over the reins. I ended up going to Safe P uh, in Breckenridge. Um, I signed July 12th, 2007. I had, I think, about two months before I had to turn myself in to uh, go to Safe P and Literally within them two months, I caught a PI and assault causing bodily injury. Gosh. And, uh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, my probation officer is like, just, just go to jail right now. <laughs> Can't take you nowhere. <laughs> Man. Yeah. So, what were you feeling during all that, dude? I, I really don't think I had feelings. You know, I mean, they were there, but, they were only there to get numbed. I, I really wasn't trying to sit with them. So that's why I was so induced with uh, uh, drugs and alcohol. And even when I went to county that, that other time, you know, in 2007, after the, the raid, I slept for three weeks. So I didn't, I didn't have an opportunity to feel. And as soon as I bailed out, I used my income tax money to bail out because it was the beginning of the year. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah great way to use it i guess right mm. and uh i just i just went back to drinking and stuff I, I literally ran from my feelings they came out in the the worst way ever that's where my aggression came out non-caring attitude uh came out through the resentment and anger i had from my childhood from what my dad did and my mom you know so so safe p it's like court ordered rehab, right? Uh, it is a court ordered, and it's it's a lot more extravagant than a rehab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, safe P is from five o'clock in the morning till ten at night. Your structured environment, time management. Mm. You know what I mean. You are part of TDCJ, but it's called a Gateway Foundation at the time, so it was privately owned, but they had TDC guards to watch over you. Uh, you, you only ate twice on the weekends. You didn't eat at lunch. Uh, you would have to wake up at three thirty, four o'clock in the morning to go get your necessities, which were the white uniform that you'd have to wear like a regular TDC. Um, you would have to do four hour classes, uh, for rehabilitation, but also work a four hour TDC job. Mm. And, uh, so it, it was, it was pretty, pretty intense. How long were you in there? Six months. I was in there six months and it also comes with the halfway house sentence. <laughs> so you got to go to the halfway house for three months afterwards. And I ended up in Dallas, Texas. So uh, from September 2007 to March 2008, I was in Safe P. March 2008, I was in Dallas, Texas at the halfway house. And uh, there, you know, I, I was I was doing all right. And all the while, mind you, every time I got locked up, I found God. I mean, ain't that, ain't that so like what people say, right? I found God, you mm -hmm. know, when I'm locked up, but they call it jailhouse religion. There's yeah. the word I'm looking for. Yeah. And, but I really did find him. I just didn't know how to keep him mm. when I got out. Right. So when I was in Dallas halfway house, I was doing good for about 40 days, 45 days. And I showed up to the halfway house drunk and there I am getting in trouble by the halfway mm. house, getting kicked out. So, you know, it, it was just a non, an ongoing process all my life. That's one thing that I've learned looking back in hindsight is if you don't face yourself, eventually you're going to make a mess of you. Getting an opportunity 
to start over, start fresh, getting drunk and high, getting another opportunity, that in and out, in and out. Uh, how much longer did this go on? Tell me about what it was that you figured out that had you known you wouldn't have done so much of that in and out. It went on for 11 more years. So I did two sentences of safety, two sentences of TYC, one state jail sentence. When I get out of safe P, I'm in Odessa now, Texas, halfway house over there. And K2 was a big thing. Oh, yeah. And there I am smoking that oh, stuff. Oh, man. Yeah. It really, I, I, again, I, I'm going to say in state jail, them county sentences and safe P, I always had my relationship with God. And that takes me to one of the scriptures I want to share. And I'm so grateful for this scripture. And it's even in a song. But in 2 Timothy 2.13, even we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he could not deny who he is. And it just reminds me that how much he loves us and how much he's willing to give to us. Not that he just sacrificed his son, but when we shake our fists at him, when we turn our back on him, when we cuss him out, he's still willing to love us when we're willing to be accepted back. Mm. And uh, That's good. Through all those back and forth, I'm so grateful that I could be that prodigal son that could keep on running back to open arms. And he was always waiting for me with open arms, always on the lookout. That right there is a feeling like no other because sometimes you feel like you can mess up enough and burn bridges that people don't accept you back into their house. They don't accept <clears throat> you back as a person in their lives. They kind of cut you out. Right. And uh, God never did that to me. He never did. You know, so that was one of the that was a, a testament of his love and faithfulness of who I was for him. And uh, it took about another three years after 2014 and going to say P again to to really see that. In 2015, I got out of the halfway house. I got a DWI. Caught out of caught out of Odessa County Jail and went on the run because I knew the DWI would revoke my probation. Man. And so I went on the run. No, about 15 months before I got caught. And then 2016 of August, back in county jail, ended up in prison. Probably about, I think it was January 17th or 19th, somewhere around there of 2017, I got baptized in prison. When I got baptized, the song that was playing, and I, and I, I loved it before I got baptized, and it was so fitting that it was playing when I got baptized. I mean, and mind you, there's a line, you know, so they're playing multiple songs, right? Because the line's so long, just to keep the, the music in the background going as they're baptizing people. There's probably about 40 people getting baptized because the TDC facility's pretty big. And uh, they get to uh, Big Daddy Weave, redeemed. I am redeemed, <laughs> yeah. you set me free. That's a good song. And uh, so when that song came on at the time, I was one of the last ones to get baptized as I was getting baptized, like I literally felt like it was a baptism of the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, we get baptized to show our confession an open confession to our congregation and our other family members in, in the, uh, the, the Christian community. But there's also a baptism of the Holy spirit. And uh, I, I really feel like that's what happened. My eyes just opened up. And uh, that same day I got baptized, I went back to my dormitory and I had my move slip. And the move slip basically entails that you're going to go to your actual unit where you're going to serve your time at. Mm. Everyone's looking for that slip because you're there only for 30 to 45 days before you're going to, they're looking for that slip. So the, the anxiety and, and the, the urge to want to get out of this place so you can finally sit somewhere knowing you're going to do the majority of your time and get comfortable, right? And that slip was there. So I thought that was a sign in itself. I get to prison in Jacksboro. Jacksboro, Texas, and uh, it's called the Lindsay Unit. And uh, I'm there, and, and there's a thing they call the faith-based storm. And the faith-based storm basically is uh, for you to become more of a disciple for Christ. It's something that they started doing in prison not many years prior to you. Mm. And, but it was always full because you had sex offenders that didn't want to be in dorms where gangs and other people were doing what they wanted to do because of getting beat up, because of getting their commissary took in, things like that. You had people that didn't want to be in gangs no more that would catch out to this dorm because otherwise their gang's going to jump on them. 
Mm-hmm. You had people that were burning their bridges in dorms by saying, I'll pay you back if you get me. And now they had a tab that was ran up. Yeah, people are basically using the faith-based dorm as a protection. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. The chances of going to that, that faith-based dorm were slim to none. I literally was running a prayer circle in a dorm full of people still doing meth, mm-hmm. still doing meth, mm-hmm. and gang members. And I was a little timid, believe me. You know, to be like, prayer call, prayer call, in a dorm where people were like <laughs> just doing their own thing. But it was something that God gave me the courage to do. You know, sometimes we can get so caught up in wondering how we're going to uh, be able to speak to someone, how we're going to be able to help them. What what are the words I'm going to pray for this person? Or even like with this podcast, how is it going to work out? You know, so that the nervousness or, or the anxiety or trying to figure it all out with our logical mind, right? But, you know, he told me, just show up and I'll show out. Mm. So as I show up in certain instances, like, you know, we mentioned prior to this, the Holy Spirit will lead, you know, and that's what the Holy Spirit would do. I was calling prayer call, you know, consistently every night. And sometimes the ones that I thought that would make me timid and hesitant to want to call it were the ones joining it. And that's when I realized that God is, God is, is more than I can think. His thoughts are higher than mine, you know, and I would never understand. But his conviction and his love for people is uh, is what's going to bring people to the right places. Again, going back to the faith-based dorm, uh, it wasn't a, about a week later, I get a move slip from my bunk. And come to find out, I'm going to that faith-based dorm. And uh, that is just a testament of obedience to call in that prayer call every night. You know what I mean? And, and when you're doing something God asks you to do, he can move mountains for you. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what he did. You know, there's a song that says, uh, I, I don't know how you're going to make a way, but I know you will. You know, yeah. and uh, that's what he did for me. And he's done that numerous of times. That's when I that's when I realized, you know, he, he really does love me. You know, I am somebody in his life because I didn't screw it up so many times back and forth playing that game with him. Like, I need you now, God. I don't need you no more. I need you now, God. I don't need you no more. But every time when I said I needed him, he was there. He, he never once said, nope, you, you keep on choosing to do your own thing. I don't want you now. The thing that I've learned is when you have small acts uh, of obedience, he can increase your faith through the blessings he gives you in that obedience. Mm-hmm. And so my faith was increased. You know, to go to this faith-based dorm and and uh, and everything. And the reason why I was able to get in there, a guy literally almost got in a fight with another one in the faith-based dorm. So they kicked that guy out oh, and they put me in. That was just like a wow moment for me. So as, as we're moving forth with that, man, there, there's a couple of songs that, uh, that we could listen to because we would have worship songs. They would bring people from the outside to give us lessons on uh, discipleship and, and just building spiritual principles. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. What was that like? Compared to where I was at, where people were dealing drugs, are still high in a prison system, doing tattoos, fighting in the corners, smoking K2 to a place full of peace, full of love, full of uh, character building, uh, admitting your wrongs, and being able to have people coming from the outside showing their love and, and discipling you as well as bringing uh, uh, lessons like Max Licato lessons, you know, uh, Bill Garther seminar, which is back in the eighties and also worship music. That's when I learned about Carrie Joe. And that's when I was like, Oh man, they do make beautiful Christian people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I, 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 I literally thought they did. And I thought that, you know, it was a whole different world for mm-hmm. me. And, uh, but it, it was awesome, man. It, it, it just entails that the love that is able to be expressed through other people if we lit it, right? Because it was put on them people's hearts to go into the prison systems, to be a beacon of that hope, to be a sense of encouragement and also an expression of God's love. And so it was awesome, you know, to, to, to experience that. Man. A song like, uh, that really hit me too was the Dear Younger Me. And I think it's Mercy Me that sings it. Dear younger me, it's not your fault. You were never meant to carry this beyond the cross. 
man, that, that just hit me right in the heart because all my life, I thought I had to carry all the burden. Not of just my mom being neglected, abandoned and abused, but my little brother having to be taken care of at an early age. You know, seeing my, my older brothers and sisters going through turmoil, I thought that was all my weight. And it never was. But carrying that weight led me to my addictions, led me to my aggressiveness, led me to my impulsiveness, led me to the choices that ultimately landed me. And what we'd say now is arrested by grace. Did you dread when the day was coming for you to get out? Hmm. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a, that's a good question. There's a, a prison entrepreneurship program and not many people get sent the postcard or get sent the invitation. Because uh, it's in another unit. Well, they send me the invitation. You fill out an application and you write an essay. And I did all that and I got accepted. You know what I mean? So I'm moving east of Dallas to another unit that's even more Christian based and like just, you know, an expression of uh, biblically, wow. right? A couple months of being there, I had made an FI1 in parole, which means within 30 days you'll be out. So like I was at a limbo. Like, I'm ready to get out or I could deny parole, do these last 10 months of my sentence and actually embrace what this uh, uh, program has to offer. What'd you do? I left. 30 <sighs> days, I left. I was ready, man. I was ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was ready to go home. But at this time, I thought through the ups and downs, through having expectations of since I've changed, other people need to change. Those have ceased. You know, I had to erase them because they didn't work before right. and they led me back to where mm -hmm. I was. So I had to erase these preconceived thoughts of what other people should be doing. I had to realize I need to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I get out 2018 of uh, January and um, I did good for about three months and I start drinking. Right. Yeah. And in my mind, though, I'm like, I'm not doing meth. Uh -huh. I'm not doing marijuana. <laughs> I'm just drinking and I'm around. In addiction long enough, you start being drawn to a certain type of people. Mm -hmm. So even though I was still drinking, I was still drawn to those people that were doing these things. And uh, so I was sleeping with women that were still on drugs, that were still drinking. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They weren't doing anything for themselves. I, 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 I was just attracted to it. It was something that I didn't realize that I had to – like a. a readjust my mindset with it's a whole new discipline you have to kind of uh put within yourself within your mind so january i get out 2018 by june 2018 i meet my first baby mother she's she's an amazing girl you know it was really good we we got pregnant in uh november 2018 and i mean i'm, I'm working my butt off i'm doing probably 132 140 hours every two weeks you know what i mean just just getting after it you can't trade one addiction for another mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what i did was instead of becoming a drug addict and alcoholic i became a workaholic mm -hmm. so i was working so hard and so much that not only does it does you throw yourself at something else but you start losing some parts of yourself i started mm -hmm. losing my relationship my connection with the girlfriend that i was trying to build a life with with the baby that was soon to be and at times, because I was still drinking, on my one or two days off that I would have within them two weeks, I felt like I needed to catch up with drinking. Mm -hmm. And so there I was, you know, going all out and drinking. And someone like me in addiction, you don't drink to wait till the buzz hits you. You drink until you're just drunk. And that happened with me. And it was a New Year's weekend because I was working that New Year's for 2019. And. So I got off the week after uh, New Year's actual day. I was like, I'm going to make up for the New Year's I missed. And I went to the bar and everything. And old girl, she let me go. She's, she's waiting at the house for me. And I come home drunk, start mess with her, pretty much kick her out of my house. She's two and a half months pregnant. Yeah, like it was a mess. There I am, man, alone again. But a month after she left, here I am seeing baby mom another two. Right. So February 2019, I'm messing with her. I pick up the meth again, you know. Man. Yeah. You know, I, I pick it up. I, you know, 
uh, shame and guilt can really, really uh, uh, pull you down to dark pits. And they're a lie from the enemy. You know, uh, there's another song. And I, I love worship music so much. Uh, but it's called The Father's House. And it says to leave your shame and guilt at the door because you're welcome into the Father's house. And uh, I never would leave it. I would always carry it with me, especially since I just did that, you know, to my baby mother and stuff. And so I felt so bad. So I started seeing this girl in February and, you know, basically a back and forth with, with her and the other baby mama. And I get her pregnant and we have another kid. And basically, uh, I, I don't want to, I'm not with neither one of them no more. We're in 2020 of February and I moved back to winters. Mind you, I was living in Big Spring at the time of two, you know, when I got out of uh, prison, I get back into the deepest parts of my addiction. Like I was back when I was 19, back to shooting up. Uh, I haven't seen my kids and over, I've never met my daughter. You know, I haven't seen my son in about a year. Here we are again, man, from 2020 to 2021, just deep in my addiction January 21, my house got raided. Mm -hmm. They found a little over 16 grams of methamphetamines, and there I'm in county jail, and this is how good God is. So when I get in there in the county jail, I'm like, can I have a Bible? You know, and they gave me a Bible, and I just sleep with it close to my chest, or I use it for a pillow. And that's not why I wanted it. I just wanted it close to me, because he's the only one that's ever been close to me. I'm using the phone to call my bell bonds that I used all the other times through all my other county jail stints, right? And this phone is just not going through to him. Like I'm consistently using it and it's not going through to him. And it's a black phone, mind you, right? About the second day, I'm finally like, hey, like, why isn't it going through to, you know, so-and-so? He's always helped me out because my bond was $60,000, you know, 10% of 60,000 is six grand. Every bell bondsman I called, they wanted 1500 to $2,000 up front. I didn't have that kind of money. I had $600, which my mom was going to give me, which she told me not to tell my sister or brothers because <laughs> I've been in and out so much, right? <laughs> They're like, let him stay there. He did it to himself. But she was like, I got 600. Anyhow, so a sergeant on the right after lunch was like, try this phone. And so it was a white phone. I pick it up, I dial the number, the man answers. Yeah, I'll bail you out with $600. Mind you, everyone else is wanting $1,500 to $2,000. And on top of that, the other phone I was using, I could not get a hold of him with. So when he bails me out and I'm sitting in the front of the county, he tells me he hasn't had anyone bonded out in the last two months. That I was the first one in two months. That right there is a testament of God's goodness to me. You know, I could have been sitting in there the whole time, but I wasn't. And he's like, I don't know why that sergeant told me to use that phone. But when I did, the man answered, I got out the same day. The reason why I mentioned the black phone and the white phone, because it reminds me of darkness and light. $1,500 to $2,000 was what I was looking at. But when I got that white phone, it was like grace. It was like mercy, you know, it was like love. And I got out, you know, with $600. And like I said, he said I was the first one he bonded out in two months. And mind you, he's the one that bonds everyone out in that county. Everyone else that you call are from different counties, Coleman or Tom Green. He's the only one in Runnels County besides another lady. And so it was just like, God just kind of like, aha, I'm here still, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I get out, man, and, and uh, I start doing meth again you know this is february of 2020 21 and uh from february 21 to august of 20 or july of 21 I, I kept using still and i haven't been indicted yet on my case or anything but in july of 21 i finally called my mom and i was like i need to do something like i haven't seen my son in a year and a half i haven't met my daughter I'm just a dead of a person and I'm looking at this case like I don't know what's going to happen. Well, I go to rehab, Journey Recovery Center, shout out. You know, it's an awesome place. Uh, August 5th of 21, which is my my clean date. I haven't used since then. No alcohol, no drugs, no mind altering chemicals to the glory of God. You know what I mean? And um, about a month and a half, about a month after that, 
uh, my cousin dies. You know, my cousin passes away and I'm still in journey. Uh, my counselor calls me in there and he, he tells me that my cousin passed from cirrhosis of the liver, 34 years old. Hmm. And uh, this, you know, if you know anything about Mexican families, especially here in West Texas, cousins grow up like brothers. You know what I mean? And, and that's how it was for us. Hmm. And uh, the thing about it is the day or two before he passed, we write little sayings on the back of the gated fence in the back of the rehab. And there was a message that someone had wrote that says, I want to be a voice to all those I lost to addiction. And like that really resonated when I did find out he passed away. Now, did I want to smoke? I did. Did I want to leave? I did. And I was going to go to sleep. And I felt like God told me is don't go to sleep. Because if you go to sleep, you're not going to grow mm. through feeling it. Mm -hmm. You need to stay up and feel it. Going to sleep is going to be the same as using a drug or drinking alcohol. Wow. So you don't feel it. So That's stay, good. Yeah. So yeah. stay up and feel it. And uh, I did. And I, I read a little bit of scripture. And one of the scriptures that uh, I wrote is I read was, Come to me, all those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right there, out of that was born uh, Beacon of Hope Ministries. That's a ministry that I have for the homeless now. You know, it was in that moment of staying up and feeling it. God brought some revelation to me, hmm. but also some peace. I saw my cousin's face smiling in my heart, not in my mind. It was in my heart. And I was at peace with his passing. And it reflected me to that saying that I said I read in the back. I want to be a voice to all those I lost to addiction. So I wrote a page and a half. And I felt like it was me and him communicating in the spirit that I wrote that page and a half down. And a lot of it was basically the uh, he was voicing his thoughts to all of us as a family that don't blame no one for my passing. Get forgiveness because it's through unforgiveness that we kill ourselves. Don't hate, don't resent, and don't hold on to anger because in those things, it leads you to the worst things that you can become in life which is ultimately what made him pass away at 34, you know, from the things that he didn't give up in life. But what was crazy is during the rosary that I went to, I get a phone call through my sis my brother. I'm getting indicted for the charge that I caught earlier that year on the same day of going to my cousin's rosary. Like, what are the odds of that? Right. Mm. And as much as, I, as much as we like to say there's God's divine appointments, I feel like the enemy also has his appointments to try mm -hmm. to get us off track. So to have a passing of my cousin and also getting told that you got an indictment on a day you're trying to mourn something was almost like a slap in the face. But thank God that I had already had been building my faith. God has been implementing his love through all these times. And that's why I say the sanctification process, mm -hmm. even though I didn't get it every time I got in and out, he was always dropping seeds and they finally brought fruit that day to where I didn't leave. I didn't let it make me run or anything. I'm still okay. The devil knows that you're getting closer with God. He knows that that's what you're going for. When he started noticing that he was like, let's remind him of who he truly is with air quotes. Right. And I mean, you're, you're so right. I mean, you're dead on with that. It's, it's one of those things that the, he likes to bring up our past mm -hmm. and, and try to use it against us so we can leave, go back to that shame and guilt. You mm -hmm. know, thank God that I wasn't that I didn't have to go back to that. I think I've ran that course long enough and mm -hmm. I realized that course uh, was a never ending cycle. You know what I mean? It, it never stopped. So I, I get out, man. And and. When was this when you got out? Uh, of I got out of a uh, journey rehab in September 10th of 2021. Yeah. And uh, I got indicted probably around September 2nd. Mm -hmm. And that's when my cousin passed away around the same time. I get out of journey rehab and, you know, I got indicted, so I'm not going to court yet. But I get a call in mid October from my lawyer saying I have a court date for November 4th. And, you know, I'm doing the right things. You know, I'm working. I'm at sober living, paying my debt because I felt like God was like, look, you owe these debts. Mm -hmm. Like it ain't about getting your credit score up. 
this is part of your inventory. You need to pay the things that you've done in your past and your addiction so you can make it right. You know what I mean? And move from that. Well, there are earthly consequences. You know, it's 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 things we've done and now we have to we have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I didn't have that relationship or that communication with Christ, I don't think that I would have paid him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd have left him, you know. I get that call from the lawyer and she's saying I got court November fourth. And I'm like, Well, what's the plea bargain? What are we looking at? Fifteen years to life. Mm. This is a second degree felony. Habitual. 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 Because I had been in and out so many times. They enhanced my second degree felony to a first degree felony, which a first degree felony, mind you, is five to ninety nine. But they enhanced that from fifteen to ninety nine. So I mean it rocked my boots, had me mad, had me angry. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't even work no more. I was over there working and like it just it took me out of myself for a minute, you know? Man, like it, it wasn't easy. From uh November fourth I went, they told me that basically to to make it condense from November fourth to August sixth, I battled that case. You know, you heard the uh the story of the paralytic man and how his friends took him to the top of the roof and lowered him down to Christ. And Christ says, your faith didn't heal you, the faith of your friends did. So I had faith in Christ because he already revealed to me that I wouldn't see a day in prison. I wouldn't see a day in county jail. And through a logical mind and through my experience, if I'm looking at 15 to 99, if they come down on anything, you might do six or seven years in prison. Mm. They ain't coming down all the way to a probation sentence, especially if you never completed one successfully. Mm. Right? Yeah. But God planted that on my heart. So it was a promise he gave me. It's only through obedience because I walked that out in faith, right? Because my logical mind ain't going to comprehend it. I just have to stay the course. But Mm -hmm. I'd be lying if there wasn't days where I doubted. If there wasn't days where like I was trying to buy things for my trailer to make it more homey. And the enemy was like, why are you wasting money on that? You're about to go to prison anyways. Like that could be commissary money. Like, why don't you save for, you know, for commissary? (laughs) And, And, uh. And so like I wouldn't. So in those moments of that doubt is where that story of the paralytic man came in about the friend's faith healing them is when I would reach out to my prayer warriors. I had anywhere between four and eight people that when I had doubt, hesitancy, uh, I wasn't standing on his word as much as I I knew I, I could. I would reach out to these people and be like, I need prayer right now. I'm not sure if this is going to come through, if God's promises is real and so on and so forth. And so these people would pray for me and I could literally feel the energy of them prayers while I was working. We're in 2023. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. What's happening right now? It's, it's, you know, I have a son. Um, I got a little over 20 months clean and sober. Uh, I have a ministry that was born, like I said, out of uh, my cousin's passing and through that time of staying up called a beacon of hope ministries. It's going to the homeless right here in San Angelo, Tent City. I'm actually under my church, Lakeview Bible Church. I actually get an allowance, you know what I mean, that I get to uh, use to spend on showers, food, prayer, and fellowship. Mm. Uh, one thing that, that God put on my heart is that uh, some, you know, through shame and guilt, you can feel like a leper, you know, like leprosy from back in the Old Testament. And so some of them, some people that are homeless, they feel like uh, society don't really care too much about them. So I'm just that uh, conduit or that lifeline in the sense to to want to encourage them that they're still people, you know, that they're not left out and they're not forgotten about. I'm grateful for God to let me be trusted with that. Are you still uh, fighting this case? No. So I became ordained chaplain through the uh, Great United Commissions. I completed journey with parenting classes, rehabilitation, anger resolution, and uh, I submitted those things in showing the initiative I was taking and the seriousness of becoming a member of society and not a menace to society. So as we did that, August 4th, we were about to, we were going to go to court. Literally about three days prior to that, I get an email from my lawyer. And mind you, the whole 10 months, they never come down off the 15 years. So about April 2nd, I get an email saying they're going to drop the enhancement. They're going to drop the Mandel charge to a lesser included crime, uh, crime, which is possession, 
and offering six years probation. Wow. Yes. That's a miracle, man. It's, it's a miracle. And the thing about it is, is I have the paperwork showcasing the paragraph, which means the habitualness, the 15 or 99, I have it all as evidence of his truth, you know? Yes. And even, even better than that, when I went to court, she said she was going to ask for a little bit lesser time on the probation sentence. So I got five years. What does the number five represent? Grace. Huh. Man, dude. So, and God put that on your heart well before any of this, yep. that you're not going to do a day in jail over it. Yep. I literally have a video from December 21st, 2022, only a month and a half into looking at 15 years that is telling people that I'm not going to see a day in prison. This is eight months prior to actually getting the sentence. Man, God is good. Yeah, dude. dude. Uh, one of the scriptures that got me through since the beginning is Galatians 6, 9. Do not grow weary in well-doing for you'll reap a harvest of blessings if you don't give up. And, uh, and I'm reaping those blessings. And I, I will say there's times where character building seems the hardest, but it's in the storm that your character builds. It's in the storm that you learn perseverance. It's in the storm that you learn to have faith in something bigger than yourself. Mm. And uh, you, you can only grow that on the other end by staying obedient to it. Man, what's your sobriety date again? 8-6-21. August 6, 2021. And is there anything that you want to give to the listeners that you may have missed? You know, there was a another scripture that I had here. It's Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ went to that cross dying for you as you were still in your sin. You don't have to clean yourself up. To get right with God. Get right with God and he'll help clean you up. It's not about us trying to fix ourselves to become something. Because in the end, it's about surrender. When you lay your life down to him, you receive a new life in Christ. The same resurrection power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead, it starts to live in you. Mm. And you can be that same resurrected person that's restored not just in your identity in Christ, but the things you thought you lost. Another, I guess, footnote is uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Uh, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You have to take them thoughts captive. Mm. Because what we believe was true in our addiction was a lie we fed ourselves. Mm. So yeah. we have to substitute the truth that we excuse for our behaviors for the truth that's the living word crazy story dude right thank you so much for sharing with us man yes, um i really believe that this is going to reach a lot of people i don't know how many a lot is but it's how i feel as we wrap this up we uh we start praying and we started with prayer we would like for you to pray for us okay all right lord father god we just come before you first of all giving you thanks we give you thanks that no matter the distractions, no matter the things that try to intervene, your message rang true. Uh, as Bailey said, Father God, whether it reaches one, whether it reaches a thousand, that's not for us to decide. But regardless, the glory goes to you. And in the end, Lord, through Bailey and, and Trent's uh, uh, faithfulness, through their obedience of running this podcast, Father God, of being willing to take some time out of their day to show faithfulness to you, I know that you already have blessings on what they're doing. I pray that you would have continuously encouraged them, Father God, help them to continuously work on this profession that it's going to become. Help them to, to learn the ins and the outs, Father God. Give them spiritual wisdom and knowledge so they can become better uh, uh, equipped to, to put your word out there, Lord. Let it be shared and subscribed to you, Father God, so it can touch the hearts that you need to be touched. I thank you, Father God, just for the camaraderie, for the fellowship, and for your spirit dwelling within us, around us, and I pray that you will, Father God, to help us continuously move forth of not just being a beacon of hope, but a light of love to all those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Bailey. And I'm Trent. 
Thank you so much for listening to this new episode. Yeah, hit the subscribe button. And like. And leave comments. And if you really liked it, share it with somebody. Tune in to this next episode. We got something special for you. I'm excited. Does he know? Yeah, he he knows. But he doesn't know. (laughs) He doesn't know the mics are picking it up, probably.